Well, greetings, viewers and voyeurs who have got that bunk. Hope you're doing well. I just want to assure everybody that I'm not done yet with my battle rap against Sereta Yuki, but I thought I'd better put out a content-driven video first so that I don't lose all my new subscribers. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be singing and dancing a little bit more probably later this weekend. Uh, I might put it out on Sunday or Monday, so be prepared for that. And that will almost certainly be the end of the matter because my attitude is, you know, uh, he who gets the last laugh wins. And I seriously doubt that Sereta Yuki is going to answer back with another battle rap video. Uh, if he does... Um, I will probably be forced to concede because I was almost forced to concede at his last battle rap video because it was bloody good. But uh, there's still room to take the piss there, and I see no harm in that. Anyway, so yeah, let's have a bit more fun with that stuff in my next video, or possibly the video after my next video. For this video, I wanted to talk about the GOP debate earlier this week um, on CNN. Uh, you know, my love for my audience is so strong that I had to watch this debate twice. That's almost six hours of my life. Um, so you're welcome. Because I wanted to make sure I had this sort of, you know, relatively fresh-ish in my head uh, when I made this video. Um, calling this kind of an event a debate is a real stretch of the English language, if you ask me. I do understand that uh, primary debates in particular are almost always more often sort of popularity contests as opposed to a genuine debate. And the real debates come after you get the Democratic and the Republican nominees and get the two debating together. Sometimes the vice presidential debates can be pretty good as well. But uh, at this point, you know, it is an awful lot of posturing and not much substance being discussed in terms of uh, policy or even, even issues, which is really disturbing. I'm very, very upset with CNN for the way that they played this out. CNN isn't Fox, but they seem to be wanting to frame the debate in the same sort of context that Fox framed the first debate in, and I find that a bit disturbing. Uh, just in general, it doesn't actually surprise me that much. Uh, it, it just bothers me, you know, that, that uh, we're allowing the media outlets to basically frame the level of discussion and the content of discussion rather than uh, the people. And I, again, I know this is early stages and you will have sort of, you know, more town hall meeting type debates uh, later on and whatever, uh, which I applaud. Then again, you know, you still have the, uh, the people running the debate deciding which questions from the audience will get asked. So it's almost a moot point. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about, because I'm not just going to disparage the debate itself. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different candidates, because uh, this is the first debate I watched all the way through. I watched segments of the previous debate on Fox, but I don't think I got to watch the whole thing. Anyway, with this debate, though, it was uh, quite depressing, because the first half, for sure, was more or less the Donald Trump show. Um, and I think I would castigate the moderators for CNN for not giving me a... Uh, other candidates uh, equitable speaking time. Uh, in particular, Mark Rubio, Rand Paul, and uh, Governor Kasich were cut off an awful lot, uh, you know, told to shut up and get on with it rather than allowed to sort of expand their points in the way that some of the other candidates are. And I suppose you could argue that that's because they have low polling numbers, but um, you know, it, one thing, it's early days yet. And for the other thing, you know, yeah, they get low poll numbers because they don't get anything like the exposure uh, that Donald and Jeb get in particular. And uh, that being so, um, maybe it would be, if you give them at least equitable exposure, then you're at least being fair, you know. Uh, and rather than sort of reinforcing trends which already exist, you know, you open the possibility that the numbers can change this way and that. Is that the responsibility of the press? I don't know. Being fair, I think, would be responsible for the press, yeah. Um, but yeah, they shouldn't necessarily be considering one way or the other, for the better or the worse, what the polling numbers are, um, other than to decide who gets to be on stage in the first place. Now let's talk about the uh, candidates in particular. Yesterday in the newspaper here, uh, I read the Independent Eye uh, on a Friday, and I saw on the inside page that uh, Carly Fiorina was uh, seen to be the best in the debate. I'm not sure seen who by whom exactly if that was a, a, a snap poll after the debate went live or whatever. I'm not sure who conducted the poll. Um, but if it's true, that raises a few points for me because I, I, I have mixed feelings about Miss Fiorina uh, on that debate because 
she, for one thing, uh, seemed to have a, a, an understanding of the complexity of certain issues, which was kind of refreshing considering her company on stage. And, uh, and you know, she has very strong opinions about uh, leadership and so forth, which I'm sure appealed to an awful lot of people. And, uh, you know, she did seem sort of knowledgeable and she carried herself with distinguished uh, grace, I think, uh, in the face of uh, comments by others, uh, particularly Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I think she carried herself off in a, in a presidential way, if that's uh, the word they use. So fair play to her. But when uh, they were talking about Planned Parenthood and she talked about the, they all talked about the, uh, the bogus videos that everybody I'm sure has already heard about where um, basically there were some people pretending to be uh, someone they weren't trying to do a gotcha on Planned Parenthood and talk about selling, uh, you know, parts of unborn babies. And, you know, I'm sure you guys all know the truth of that story, so I'm not going to go into it now because basically it's all a complete lie. Uh, the, the, it's a hatchet job. And also, you know, the, uh, the the video was selectively edited to make things look worse than they were. Miss Fiorina, on her, on her uh, topic on this subject, she mentioned the video and talked about how there's a, you know, a fully formed fetus that they're trying to keep alive because they're talking about keeping it alive long enough to harvest its brain, which is complete fabrication. Um, there is no such thing in any of the videos that have been released. So the fact that she's willing to blatantly lie right at the camera uh, about something that she could be proven to be lying about is, you know, rather disturbing. And no doubt she's only uh, repeating what she's been told by her advisors. Uh, that's no excuse. If you're going to make that kind of a claim in front of, you know, millions and millions of people, you better be telling the truth. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I, I know, you know, asking politicians to hold to a standard of truth is, is asking a lot. Um, however, like I say, you know, she was being deliberately inflammatory in the things that she was saying, and she was making completely false statements in the effort to try to uh, blackball Planned Parenthood. And there's a strong push to get Planned Parenthood defunded, as I'm sure you're all aware. And it just makes me really aggravated when I think about it because they talked about how, you know, Planned Parenthood gets $500 million of federal funding a year and, uh, and how horrible that is, you know, and Planned Parenthood does provide like really, really utterly needed services, of course. And, you know, for a nationwide program, $500 million a year, you know, $500 million is a lot of money. But uh, for a government program, uh, relatively speaking, that's not an awful lot of money. And if you think about it this way, that's about $1.60 something cents per taxpayer per year to fund something as important as Planned Parenthood. So that's less than a cup of coffee, for fuck's sake. Uh, so I think it's quite a storm in a teacup, or should be, except for the fact is if they do cut it, you know, an awful lot of people will be adversely affected. And guess what? They're mostly going to be poor people and probably not Republican voters in the first place. And this is just one example of how Republicans blatantly are, you know, they don't even want these voters. They're not even trying to get these voters. You know, they couldn't give a fuck about poor people. Not one person on the platform talks about how to improve the lives of poor people in the country. Uh, you know, everyone talks about the middle class in politics these days, and that's not unimportant. Don't get me wrong. But uh, discussion about lifting up the poor, ending poverty, uh, you know, increasing opportunities and so forth, uh, that sort of thing is just a it doesn't really make the grade anymore in popular discourse or political discourse, I should say, which disturbs me an awful lot. So that's my bit about Miss Fiorina. Um, I thought Governor Christie was uh, doing an awful lot of fear mongering, and that was really unfortunate, but not unexpected. He seems to want to run on that platform. And that's all I'm going to say about the governor. Uh, I disagreed with virtually everything he said. I would really, really, really be frightened if uh, either he or she uh, became the nominee just based on what I saw last night. If, if, if I had last night to, to place my, you know, my bet on, it would be on neither one of them. So let's uh, move down the aisle. Uh, Rand Paul, in my opinion, didn't get anywhere near uh, equitable time uh, to speak his mind. Uh, he didn't even get asked on certain topics to, to speak. And um, yeah, I, I really felt that, uh, you know, he, he made a lot of sense on certain topics. I'm not a big fan of Rand Paul, but at least he, would, he didn't sound like an idiot. He, he comes across as if what he, when he talks, he does know something about what he's talking about. And, uh, you know, on considering the company he was in, you know, that was a breath of fresh air. And I think that uh, Rand Paul in particular uh, didn't get anywhere near as much uh, airtime as... Uh, he should have done. I mean, if you're going to let the guy on the stage in the first place, then give him equitable time. 
who was next along? Oh yeah, Mike Huckabee was uh, next to him. Mike Huckabee was, you know, literally frightening to me. Uh, the man clearly wants to establish some kind of uh, uh, rebalancing of power between the three branches of government, which is really frightening to me. The president doesn't have that kind of power, and if a president tried to assume that kind of power, we would have a constitutional crisis on our hands. And uh, so that's not good. And, and Governor Huckabee uh, tried to be like Mr. Nice Guy and, you know, act like, you know, all the people on stage are his friends. And I, I think that an awful lot of those people on stage, in fact, are probably jockeying for positions in a future cabinet of whoever the nominee gets to be because they were at pains, some of them in particular, at pains not to be too adversarial with each other. And like Secular Talk said in his video the other day, uh, probably a lot of them have been advised that, hey, look, Donald Trump is really popular right now, so if you rip into Donald too much, your numbers are going to tank. So whatever you do, don't criticize Donald too badly. Because uh, they were way too deferential, in my opinion, to Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump talks an awful lot of shit. And sometimes he can blatantly be called out as, as, as being full of it, and they just don't do it. Uh, Miss Fiorina had a, had a couple of stabs at Donald Trump, and that's good, because you know it should be done. Uh, you shouldn't leave it up to the media to do these things. Uh, you know, politics is by nature adversarial. And, uh, you know, if someone says something that is blatantly false, or they should be called on it. And Jeb Bush did the same thing when uh, he said that uh, Donald Trump tried to get to gambling laws in Florida while he was governor, and he basically quashed it. Mr. Trump said that no such thing occurred, which is really, uh, you know, I hope that Bush can prove that he was lying, if he was lying, because there should be a paper, paper trail for that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, if Donald Trump could be shown to be, like, lying specifically about that, I think that would be a, a, one of the ways, hopefully, that we can take some uh, momentum out of Donald Trump's campaign. But I'll get more to Trump in a minute. Um, so, yeah, they, they each had a stab at Trump, and that was cool. Rand Paul uh, had, had some mild swipes at Trump. But Ben Carson had the best opportunity in the world because um, it was put to Ben Carson as a, as a, as a, you know, a pediatric neurosurgeon, so he knows an awful lot about children's anatomy and children's health. Um, you know, it was put to him uh, whether or not uh, Donald Trump was being irresponsible by saying that he was worried that vaccines might cause autism in some children. And uh, Ben Carson could have slapped him down right there. I mean, he was, you know, his general quiet spoken, you know, mild mannered self and, uh, you know, told Donald Trump that he could learn more about it and, and stuff and did say sort of in the most polite and indirect way that he thought that Donald Trump was incorrect. But he didn't come right down and say, no, it's really irresponsible for you to say that because thousands of people now are not going to get vaccinations thanks to you uh, spreading this nonsense. You know, get yourself an education before you talk about this kind of stuff. He could have said that stuff. He could have, but he didn't. So, uh, that was a missed opportunity for Ben Carson, as far as I'm concerned. Ben Carson, um, you know, in, in the debate last night, didn't come across too bad. However, uh, when I've seen Ben Carson in interviews and making statements, uh, I, I just think that he has nowhere near the, uh, the understanding of politics to, to get anywhere near the White House um, in terms of, uh, you know, being a president especially. So there's that. Um, yeah, Huckabee was really scary. I forgot to finish off about Huckabee. Um, he was really, you know, disturbingly scary. Who was next to Huckabee on the other side? Oh, um, Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio, uh, in my opinion, came across as intelligent, articulate. Um, he seemed relatively knowledgeable about the uh, complexities of certain subjects. And, uh, you know, he made no apology for speaking Spanish to some uh, interviews and constituents. When Donald Trump, uh, it was mentioned to Jeb Bush that Donald Trump had criticized Jeb Bush for speaking Spanish. Uh, he should be speaking English because he's running for president of the United States and, you know, English is the language and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Something like 40% of Americans have uh, Spanish as their second language or first language. So... It, this idea that uh, English is the overpowering dominant language in the United States is still true, but it might not always be true. And I don't think there's anything wrong with acknowledging diversity in our country and trying to appeal to that diversity and isn't speaking Spanish part of that. I think it's, it, it, from a campaign point of view, I think it made sense. And for Trump to try to sort of, I think, I think it's like, do, it's like dog whistle racism almost. It's like, you know, because Trump's the big anti-immigration guy on the platform and I think the, the combination of the two things it, it's sort of it's sort of 
Yeah, it reminds me of sort of dog whistle racism where you, you, you say things which aren't overtly sort of uh, racist or xenophobic or whatever, but, you know, people who have their antennas up and, and can basically pick up on the whiff of it uh, appreciate that you're sort of sticking your nose out in that direction without actually uh, letting it go. So it, it, to me, it really bothered me. Uh, you know, that's another thing about Trump that really bothers me, uh, but I'll get to Trump in a minute. I'm going to get to Trump last. Um so yeah, Marco Rubio, I, I think he distinguished himself pretty well, but virtually every policy that he did speak on, I disagree with everything he said. I don't think he'd be a good president. I think that his purpose on stage or in this campaign is to get into the administration either as a vice presidential candidate or perhaps a, a high secretarial position in the, in the cabinet. Uh, I don't think he has a snowball's chance of getting elected president or even being the nominee for the Republican Party. So. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong about that. We'll see, won't we? But I mean, at the moment, just from what I've seen, I don't really think he's a, a, a serious contender for the top spot. I've already spoken about Ben Carson, and uh, I need, I suppose, to speak about uh, Jeb Bush and Kashik now. And um, is there anyone else in between them? Uh, I think it was just Carly. Anyway, uh, yeah, Kashik, I think he, he actually distinguished himself pretty well. I, I actually thought he was a sensible person. And, you know, Everybody on stage seemed to have one thing about their career, which was, uh, I'm the only person on stage who can say this. Um, and in, you know, in Kashyyyk's favor, he's the only person on stage that has been both in Washington, you know, in Congress, and also a state governor. So in a sense, his uh, credentials uh, for you know, politics are, are, are pretty good. And he was almost alone on stage when the Iran deal was being sort of discussed. He was almost alone on stage and saying, hey, let's you know, see if it works before we rip it up. Um, and to me, that is like the most responsible thing any of them said on that subject. Um, and I, I think it's kind of unfortunate that he doesn't seem to be getting the, the level of exposure that he might uh, be due, considering his distinguished career. Uh, I don't necessarily think I would like to see him president, but uh, of the people I saw last night, he would probably bother me least if he became the nominee. Unfortunately, I really don't think that's going to happen, not without some sort of major scandal, uh, which would bring down Trump and Bush at the same time. That would be lovely. I mean, maybe we could catch them in, in both having, you know, some sort of uh, liaison with escorts or something that would do it. Anyway, I, yeah, we can dream. Uh, <laughs> right, so that was hit, Governor Kasich. I, I, I don't think he, he, along with Rand Paul, I mean, he didn't get anywhere near equitable time, no place even close to it. Jeb Bush managed to get on the mic quite a bit. Um, Jeb Bush, you know, he's been in politics an awfully long time. He knows how to handle himself in front of the TV cameras and so forth. He knows how to sound measured and reasonable. He knows how to uh, play the political game. And, uh, you know, he also has a distinguished career in politics as compared to most of the other people up there. Uh, I don't necessarily think uh, Jeb Bush would be a great nominee. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets to be the nominee because of, uh, you know, Jeb Bush, basically, it's his lineage. Also, also, the fact that he's very well known because of that, and the fact that he's not Donald Trump. I, I honestly hope, 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 hope that when people go to check the box or press the lever or whatever you have to do in your voting booth, I honestly hope that people just like, even if they were really amused and entertained by Donald Trump and you know think he's great, I just hope they get serious when they get in the voting booth and realize that they just can't, in good conscience, cast their vote for the man. But I'm just not sure people are that sort of uh, forward-thinking, uh, uh, certainly Republican voters, and I don't necessarily mean to disparage half the population there, but I do come across an awful lot of Trump supporters on the Internet, and it is alarming. So, yeah, and the fact is that he's number one in the polls is alarming. Donald Trump pulled more faces in the GOP debate than I've ever seen a grown man pull in one night in my life. He made so many ridiculous expressions, you could do a montage of them, and if, if I could be bothered to download a three hour long video and just to slice up two minutes of it, and I, I would do it myself, but fuck that, you know, he's not that entertaining. But it would make a funny video. Uh, but no, he pulled so many faces, and uh, you know, he, he seemed to expect everybody on the stage to defer to him because he's in, in the top of the polls, and this just goes straight to the character of the man. The man is without a doubt, a megalomaniac, you know, an egomaniac at the very least. And to have someone like Donald Trump uh, as president of the United States would be dangerous for everybody. Uh, his grasp of the issues was shallow, to put it mildly. Um, and what I honestly don't understand about 
people falling for Donald Trump is, you know, all he says is, you know, things like I'll get the best people and I'll make America great again. And I'm a good manager. And so I can do this, even though I'm not a politician and blah, blah, blah. And like people seem to lap it up like a thirsty puppy based on what? He says nothing of substance whatsoever. And I think, again, by, by the sort of dog whistle racism that I see, any, any politician who plays the immigration card, from my point of view, there's an element of dog whistle racism going on there, even if it's just implicit. That's only my opinion. You know, disagree with me if you want to. It's fine. It's still my opinion. But when uh, when it comes to Donald Trump's immigration plan, I mean, you know, they did sort of kind of discuss why, you know, deporting 11 million people would be, you know, uh, logistically impossible. But none of them actually really wanted to come out and say, no, it's impossible. Uh, you know, 11 million, 12 million people is half a million people a month. That's something like 15,000 people a day. So you're trying to tell me that, you know, even if you had the manpower to round those people up and, and the uh, logistical operation ready to ship them all abroad, uh, you, what are, you, are all these people supposed to just raise their hand and go, okay, I'm here illegally, come and get me? No, you'd have to have a manhunt. You'd have to basically turn this into a, I'm sorry to put it this way, but like a Gestapo type operation in order to round up people against their will and ship them all off. We're talking about such an immense operation ongoing over such an awfully long period of time. It would rip the country apart. I can't believe people seriously entertain the idea. There has to be a better solution to, if you see illegal immigrants in America as a major problem, there has to be, there just simply has to be a better solution than rounding them all up and shipping them all abroad. So that's my opinion about that. And again, the uh, the whole arguments about the wall uh, between the USA and Mexico, I, I just find that laughable, but I've already talked about that in a previous video. So I'm not gonna labor the point here. Uh, Donald Trump would be dangerous. It was asked uh, for, uh, at the beginning of the debate, uh, I think Carla Fiorina had been quoted as saying that she thought it would be dangerous for Donald Trump to have the nuclear codes. And when put to the point by the moderator, she actually buckled and said, well, that's for the voters for, to decide. It's not for me to say. Um, that kind of wishy-washy bullshit just pisses me off from any politician, whether they're Republican or Democrat. You know, you've been asked a direct question. We're not talking about whether or not you think the voters have the right to choose. We're talking about what your opinion is. So fucking express it. Thank you. If you said that before in an interview, have the fucking bottle to back it up when you're called on it on stage. Just because the man's standing right over there, I mean, he, he basically criticized you for being ugly and, and in different interview. And then when called on that, I thought she put him in his place pretty well uh, without having to lower herself to the same level. Uh, contrast that with the way Donald Trump uh, was disparaging towards Rand Paul. And uh, I think it's pretty clear Donald Trump does not have the temperament to hold high office at all. I wouldn't even want him to be the governor of my state, much less the president of the United States. And should Donald Trump be the Republican nominee next November, anybody with any conscience whatsoever, all of us who are liberals for sure, better be fucking active as hell to make sure that no way does Donald Trump become president of the United States. It can't be allowed to happen. This has already gone on way too fucking long. I'm really sorry about the length of this video, but I did want to discuss the debate because, um, you know, this, this is important shit happening. I and mean, we're talking about the future of our country. Real issues were barely even barely even discussed at that debate. And yeah, again, I want to say I know we're a long way off from the actual election, but the uh, primaries start in like a hundred something days, don't they? So, you know, you know, we're getting close to that time where this stuff's going to matter more and more as time goes on. And wouldn't it be nice if the American people were treated as an intelligent adults uh, and presented with conversation and debate about topics which actually affected their lives and uh, which they would personally like to see discussed. I didn't really see too much of that in the debate or the beauty pageant, whatever you want to call it, the popularity contest that was on CNN earlier this week. So yeah, if you stuck around to the end of this video, I really appreciate your viewership and I want to thank you very much. Please don't forget to hit the like button if you like this video and uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Until next time, people, thanks for watching and may all your ups and downs be ups.